Hello, 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 and welcome to Believe. That's B-L-E-A-V in Lions right here on the Believe Podcast Network. And as always, I am joined by the mayor of Detroit, third round pick, three-time Pro Bowler, 32 and a half NFL sacks. That's Jerry Reckon Ball. How's it going, Jerry? How was your day out on the course? Hey, man, uh, you know, we did pretty good out there today. You know, my group, we we shot, you know, uh, they, I think they told me it was like 17 under, you know, so I know we ain't attention. Yeah, yeah, it was a scramble tournament, you know, for what's down here is the Texas Bowl, and they had a golf outing day for the Texas Legends, and this year they inducted me as a Texas legend. I think it's 93 of us and stuff, so, you know, had a good day. Yeah, yeah. It look, man, it was a great day too. I mean, the weather was nice and it, it was festive and you know, just a good day to be out. How how things been for yourself and stuff? You know, I know how our weekend was on Sunday, but you know, yeah. other than that, how was your day? A uh, day was pretty good, you know. It's it's always a new day. It's always a new week and it, even with the Lions uh Lions not coming in too strong this past weekend, you know, it's it's a new day, it's a new week and there's always something to celebrate there. Yep, yep. Yeah, well, I, I, it, it, I don't know how much celebration or what type of celebration. <laughs> but, we, can but, cel- uh, we can celebrate a good week of practice ahead. How about that? Oh, man, the, the object is the game, not the practice. Alan Iverson <laughs> said, practice? <laughs> practice? <laughs> You're talking about practice. Yeah, well, talk uh, about practice, you uh, know? Right. Maybe, All we right. maybe we don't celebrate the practice. Then maybe we celebrate our friends over at Bet Online AG. How about that? Does that work for you? Hey, that that's a better option for us anyway. Matter of fact, it's a better option for anyone that wants to bet on football or basketball. They should definitely get Bet Online and, and give it a try. You know, it's better than any other ones you're using. It absolutely is, and it is the best place to bet on the Lions. Yeah, even if it didn't work out in the past week. But anyways, Bet Online AG is back and better than ever. A new web interface for the start of basketball season. And more props, more odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online remains your number one spot for all the basketball and football action this season. So head to the new updated desktop or mobile website to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use promo code BELIEVE50 to receive your bonus. From basketball, football, baseball postseason, NHL, boxing, and UFC, right to your favorite Vegas casino games, don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for the 2021 season. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to bet all your favorite sports. Bet online where the game starts. And I almost wish that this game didn't start with this 34 to 11 loss. And we, we, we lost our bet with Adam Pacman Jones and Solomon Wilcox, our friends over on Believe in Bengals. So we got to get some gift cards. And I got to admit, yeah. it hurts a lot. <laughs> Well, listen, it, it definitely stings and stuff, and, and, and in no way do I ever want to extend you on a bet, you know, and with those gift cards and stuff, I, I'm going to try to call a couple people over there and see if we can't get them, but I tell you what, you know, it was a good, as they would say, a good effort bet, you know, I was trying to ride with the home team. I, I was right there with you. I think it was the right decision. It just it just didn't pan out, and that's okay. That happens. Dan Campbell said in his press conference, they didn't do anything right, and I tend to agree with them. Focus wasn't there. He, he blames himself. He says that's his fault. Coach says when you get whooped like that, it's a reflection on him. Do you tend to agree with that? Well, for sure. He definitely has to take responsibility as a coach. I mean, a coach is the one that's supposed to prepare the team. He's the one that's gotten the other coaches in his system that's supposed to articulate a game plan that give them the best chance of winning. And then each coach work within its unit to make sure they understand the assignments and the alignments. 
And then from that, they come together in a coordinated effort again with the coaches, whereas the defensive coordinator now puts forward a scheme and how we're going to play. So now we all get the picture of how we're going to play. But it all starts with the head coach, you know, and then it goes down to the other coaches. Those guys, you know, it was, I, I would say, you know, it was a game that I didn't really think that they were potentially a good team, to tell you the truth, especially from an offensive standpoint and some of what I've seen, what I've seen in breakdowns and stuff, you know. But but we'll talk about some of that as we, you know, get into it. But, you know, it definitely starts with the coach. And I will say this and stuff, and, you know, and I've been, you know, quiet about the time that um, – Coach Campbell cried, right? Mm -hmm. And the emotion, right? I, you know, I could feel it, right? But at the same time, you're motivating men, right? And every man is motivated by different incense. Some of it can be visual. Some of it can be quiet. Some of it can be raw-raw. Some is by example, what he has to do is figure how to get his team around him, you know, because the crying part of it can start looking like the WWF, you know, whereas it's more performance. And then, you know, then you start questioning, okay, is he the guy, you know, but the real people that have to trust him is those players in there. They're the ones that have to really understand where that passion, that emotion comes from. But in front of the public, he needs to show his poise. He needs to really be poised because everyone else is looking at that. And it seemed like last week it was the tears, it was the frustration, it was the sadness. And this week it was almost anger. He was, he was frustrated after the game. He was angry. It was a little bit of a different tune. Do you think that's kind of inconsistent then? And that kind of makes the locker room start to question things a bit as i've said before you know this is a new coach they're in a new system they're getting they they inherited a personnel that may not have fit their actual scheme so in giving him time and teaching points and things like that that's one box right but over here in this other box that you're talking about okay there is you know some things that I would say as a head coach of an NFL team, you know, um, some of the, I don't want to call it Harry High School, and I don't want to really, you know, marginalize the emotion of it because, you see, some people are emotional. There's things that make me emotional, and, and when I get emotional, you know, I'm mad, and when I cry, I'm going to hit you. <laughs> okay. Hopefully, I never make you cry then. Well, well, hey, listen, it's only I, listen. I've learned how to leave the room or whatever, or or, or walk off the field, or, or talk to the ref to make sure he understands. Now, if you don't go over here and take care of that, I'm gonna take care of that. <laughs> you know. <laughs> but as a coach, though, just in real seriousness, um. Coach has somewhat of a disposition, and I'm going to say of Matt Millen. Mm. Okay, because it's the same type of, you know, energy, emotion, and raw. You want to win. You want to knock down the wall and everything. But sometimes you don't need to use dynamite when you could have used some scissors, right? Cool. All right. And, and and coach has a dynamite approach. And even with, you know, a, one of the downs that he when he went, it was, th I think, fourth and four early in the first half. And he goes for it. Now, that didn't make sense. That was emotion. That wasn't coaching. It, it felt like the it felt like a pent up fresh frustration. It's like we have right. to get this now. Exactly, because he wanted to give them a reinforcement that they could make it happen, right? But now you're playing a game within a game that's really psychological, 
The team that you played last week that stopped you on fourth and down is one thing. These guys here have a different emotion, all right? So they revved up to go and ready to answer your bell, all right? Now, again, it seems that he's wanting to be gutsy as a coach, right? You know, these four down tries and stuff. At some point, though, he's going to have to get his team to execute, you know? And then that'll take care of a lot of the emotion. He won't have to say, you know, it was, and man, I hate being long winded in these type of chats, but I'll tell you just how in, in, in on teams that I were on, that I was on in the pregame, I would say this to the locker room. Every man get his man and every good man get two. Don't wait on tomorrow morning to go look in the newspaper to read what you can take care of today. I so like let's that. go out here and write our story. Every game, that's what I said. Because that's what mattered. That day, that game. Don't care what they're going to say in the paper. We can write write the story today. Mm -hmm. All right? So yeah. when Dan comes and, and says those things, and he's talking after the fact he had a chance to write the story. He needs to be able to make those adjustments. He They didn't do well in making their adjustments at, at the halftime. But anyway, I know we got some other areas to Oh, you know, things, don't but, worry. You can you can check me. I got goosebumps here. Listen to the listen to that speech. Hey, I, that that's what's in me. You I know, love it. <laughs> that's what's in me. You so know, we'll move on to the Bengals real quick. Joe Burrow, he's just too good, man. Like 271 yards, three touchdowns, one to tight end CJ Uzama, one to running back Chris Evans, one to running back Joe Mixon. Add another four grabs, 97 yards from Jamar Chase, and eight minutes left in the game, and Joe Burrow doesn't have to play anymore. That's how good he was. It was, it, it's upsetting being that out of a game. And so, any takeaways from watching Smoke and Joe? Well, if I could just talk about that offense as a whole, absolutely. Okay? Yeah, I was probably on one of the most potent offensive teams team, which was the Minnesota Vikings in 98 when we go 15-1. and one. We had three receivers, and we had two running backs, and we had two quarterbacks, right? Mm -hmm. That's how Cincinnati. Now, the guy Joe Burrow definitely is a player, all right? And, not, and he's going to get better because, you know, early on when you're a rookie quarterback, the game is still kind of fast. But when it starts slowing down like it does for Tom Brady, OK, this guy's going to be something special. But I must talk about these running backs, man. Mm -hmm. They got a great one, too, with Evans and Mixon. And, you know, Mixon himself reminds me of Marshall Falk. He's built like him. He looks like him in the uniform. He works well in space. But he got that nice herky jerky, meaning that he got good moves. And they're always going forward. A lot of times people make their moves and they bounce. When he makes his moves, it's always at an angle that keeps him perpetually going forward. So I like that in his running style. And then when it comes to the receivers, you know, for half and stuff, we slow chase down. Okay, but those other receivers were making plays. So from a standpoint of an offense, they're very potent. And if their defense can truly, you know, play everyone like they played the Lions and keep them down, it's going to – they're a hard team to beat. They will be a hard team to beat, you know. But they're also in a conference where they're going to have to play their best football because Pittsburgh is not going to lay down. Baltimore is going to lay down. And Cleveland is definitely there to try to prove something. And you said it last week when we were talking to Solomon and Pac-Man – this is probably the best division division in football. We just got unlucky having to cross over with the AFC North this year, but that's show business. You just got to live yeah. with it. And so, like you said about those running backs, 125 yards rushing, 108 yards receiving, 233 yards to the running backs. Yeah. That 
that's demoralizing to me. What does Jerry Ball think about that? And did anything like that ever happen while you were patrolling the line? Yeah, I I remember one game, Barry Ward stitched our ass for two hundred plus yards, and it wasn't. It was like it was nothing we could do. Now I'm having a good game, but a good game don't mean a hill of beans when a running back that ran for 205 yards or something like that on a defense, you go down with the ship, right? All right, so I've been in one of those in that game. That's the only game I've ever been in where a guy, no matter what we did, it just seemed like we could not. He was breaking runs after getting hit, but they were bouncing on us. But anyway, long short, you know, um, the defense, you know, as young as they are, some of them, this is really, that was a real test for them. They, they played okay, but they're pros. So I'm going to hold them to the pro standard. And the pro standard says you get your man. There ain't no excuse. You tackled him, you covered him, you blocked him or not. The film don't lie. Because when, they, when they're in film and, and the coach has that red dot on the play and they keep running back and forth and he's not saying nothing, he's showing you where it broke down. So there's going to be a lot of red dots on some of the film reviews where guys will see where they broke down. And I would tell well, go ahead. We'll, we'll get to the offense. I want to talk about something that I've seen too with the offense. Yeah, well, and back like what you said, you can have a great game, a gap completely plugged, doesn't matter if they're bouncing it off tackle for 200 yards. So it's just, it's not all bad on D like, like we can talk about here, like Amani or He has his third pick of the season. That's pretty impressive. Julian Aquara. He has his first sack has a hit in a hurry. Austin Bryant, second sack of the year and Aleem McNeil. He gets his first hit of the season, takes burrow down. This, yeah. this, do those guys get any credit at all? Or do we just have to say, Hang it up. No, this was a loss overall. Well, you know, every week they should make improvement, right? Okay. And, and when you're talking about making improvements and stuff, you got to use some measurement of yourself. You know, did they play better than last week in some areas? But did they play better as a defense than last week? They did not. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we might have, you know, again, one or two players that are playing good or making plays. But at the end of the day, it's the people that, you know, at, that are going to show up day in, day out, every play that makes the most of the opportunity. And those guys, you know, I can tell you they were trying, you know, but at the same time, that offense was a little much for them. Yeah, it really was. And part of that, they did end up having that starting right guard, Jackson Carmen. We talked about he might have been out with uh, with COVID list. He ends up playing, but he's dealing with an upset tummy, allegedly from Mom Spaghetti, that new Eminem restaurant. <laughs> so I, I know Jerry would be messing with a rookie with or without food poisoning. How did you deal with rookies early on to let them know who's boss? Did you like what what did you do there? Well, all right. It's not it's not a really a boss type thing, you know. All rookies on all teams will be hazed, just like in college, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the type of hazing that might take place. Um <laughs> we've taped guys to chairs and we've shaved heads. That might happen. <laughs> We've poured, you know, the whole cool of water on a rookie and then taped them outside on the goalposts in the winter. Yeah, we, we've taken rookie's shoes and we frozen them in an ice bucket while we're at work. So that when it's time to go home, he would have to thaw his shoes out. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> now, if you want to get deviant now, I'll tell you the deviant stuff. Of course. We would take 
and look, we'll take Icy Hot, and then we'll take one of the tongue, the uh, the pressers, when they say ah, and we'll scoop it in, and then we'll push it all the way to the tip of their cleats. So when they put their shoes on, the socks is going to absorb it, but he won't feel it until he's on the field. <laughs> so his feet is hot. <laughs> they're sweating, they're burning, and then it gets cold real quick. Too. Hot, hot, and every and everyone kind of will know what's going on. So everybody be waiting on him to, you know, start doing the little fire dance. <laughs> And, and that's what you do to toughen those rookies up. So when they do face a Jerry ball on the defensive line, they can handle it. Is there? Hey, well, they can handle it. I handle it. But, but you see, I, I use reverse psychology. You mm -hmm. see, one of the things the, the the real deal about the Hayes in, in, in actual team building, it's actually showing a level of humility mm -hmm. and, and with humility, you can actually lead, right? But if a guy wants to be a part of the team, he's going to get some of what everyone has went through. I don't care who you are, all rookie, every class goes through this. And then the, the real first thing that they do to really see, these, these other things happen after they see that you don't like doing it. And this is the first test. The first test is when they ask you to sing your school song mm -hmm. at, at, at the meal table, whereas all the players are there, the coaches are there, and they start tapping on the glasses, that means some rookie needs to stand up and sing his school song. And what would happen is, is that every time they tap the glasses, I would stand up and start singing to the point that they recognized that I wasn't going to be embarrassed to do it, <laughs> that they would tell me, Ball, sit down, sit down. And they left me alone the rest of the year. The guys that didn't like to do that, that's the ones that got their shoes froze and got taped to the goalpost because it was, you know, like, hey, hey, you like everybody else now. Don't think we can't all jump on you. <laughs> Well, and I'm sure it was pretty easy to get up there and sing. You probably have a beautiful singing voice as well. I've heard, <coughs> <laughs> I've heard that uh, you might actually be a a baller as well, a hooper, according to some of our friends on oh, on Twitter. Hey, no doubt. Oh, I, I got a nice little ball game before my knee kind of got messed up with that chop block. I man, I got a nice game. I still can shoot it. You know, I don't do. Don't dunk it and do a lot of the running, but I could shoot it. Yeah, there was a, a Twitter thread that was started by at Archibom or Archambo3 on Twitter. Mike Archambo, who he says, but hi, by the way, Jerry. Uh, Tell him I said hello. Will do, will do. And they had some Lions fans sharing their thoughts. So someone mentioned that you're a baller. You used to be able to dunk it and then just wreck offensive lines. And then. Yep. Also heard from at Bushwood underscore C that every time you got one of your many sacks throughout your career, the entire crowd would chant ball sack, ball sack. Is that true? Yeah, well, they would say ball sack, but the thing that they would actually, you know, my nickname was Icebox, right? Mm -hmm. And it was either Wrecking Ball or Icebox that would really be what said in the stadium. And I tell you, man. One of the greatest feelings and stuff. It ain't. It, it's nothing. I, I'm sure other people have experienced great things in their life, but one of the best feelings I've ever had is there in the Silverdome and in the Metrodome in Minnesota, with everyone calling your name, and you in in the middle of the field, and this man, it's, it's unreal. It's unreal, and they, you know, holding that. I was like, you know, it's one of those things like you caught up in the emotion of it and you still got to play. But, you know, it's a real acknowledgement, you know, that goes with that. And I, you know, I appreciated the moments, too. Oh, I bet. I just, Again, goosebumps just hearing about it. But so does that make the next play harder or easier to kind of like on, on the field? Does that get you hyped or does that get you distracted? Oh, no, it, 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 I, I'm hyped. I'm hyped. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, you done gave me a shot of adrenaline. You know, now nah, I'm it's like having a rocket booster or, or a nitro pack put in my back now. <laughs> oh, maybe the Lions could have used that, especially on offense. Now we can finally get to it. Scoreless at halftime for the third time this season, Jerry. It took until the fourth quarter before they put any points on the board. Like, what is going on there? Like that that's gotta be an angry halftime. Well, I, I, I tell you, it's disappointing, you know, it, one, because, um, again, they're pros and they have to go about their job and he's there to move the ball efficiently, right? And he just didn't, to me, Jared didn't show the efficiencies. He didn't show the poise that even if a quarterback is flustered, he still maintains a level of poise. And, you know, by, you know, not having any points at halftime, you know, that's a Debbie Downer. That's for sure. Very much a Debbie Downer. Like, I, it, it's, it, it sucks because there was 10 nothing at halftime. It could have been a game still at this point. And then the entire third quarter scoreless as well. So I'm sure it was an angry halftime. Have you ever been a part of those angry halftimes or is it more, silent angry oh man listen well i could tell you this locker rooms have many war stories mm -hmm. i remember one one time should i could tell you things in a, with the lines but i'm gonna tell you one with bill belichick all right so this is i the lines and and the browns work a trade for me in 92 so I'm on the team with Belichick, which is, you know, his first team. He's the head coach. And um, we're playing San Francisco on Monday night, and we end up beating them on Monday night. But this is what happened. So <laughs> uh, right at halftime, Bernie Kozar comes up to the line, and we were on the 40. And it was one of those plays where Bill was trying to prove that he was an offensive minded coach. So he was calling plays. So when Bernie comes up to the line and the receiver, Michael Jackson sees the other co the cornerback come up and press him. Well, Michael Jackson ran a four, two, nine, four, three, one. So right off, Bernie knows the guy can't run with him. So they check to a nine route. A nine route is a goal. Mm -hmm. It goes for a touchdown. So halftime comes, and I'm telling you, Belichick is, ooh, he riding Bernie up and down the wall, sideways, upside down, inside out, and then we had to go back out. They never, ever, ever got a chance to talk to any other players or make any adjustments a whole halftime with Belichick telling him, don't you ever, the next day, it's about 1230, we have to be in at 1 o'clock when you're a veteran. It start training room at 8 in the morning. So that morning, all the rookies, and so it's about 1230, I'm coming in, I'm about to go get some ice before we go into the meeting, I'm going to just ice my legs and stuff while we're watching film. Bernie's coming down the hall and he's shaking everybody's hands and, and I'm and he says, big fella, man, he say, man, it was an honor to play with you, man, and just watching what you do, man, you know. I'm like, man, what are you talking about? He say, man, Bill cut me. Now you talking about a guy that started the night before on Monday Night Football, and we win the game. And when he checked the play, the, the play actually goes for a touchdown. We won that game. I think it was by some margin that we needed the touchdown to win the game. And he cut him the next day. So not only does that halftime get volatile, it's people lose their job by halftime. <laughs> oh no kidding well, yeah i don't i hope and i don't think any lions lost their job today are we are we closing in on that on that kind of uh era well, well i would tell you yes 
I mean, honestly, when you 0-6, you got to look at every player that's on the board that's available to try to make your team better. If the Lions isn't doing that, then they need to fire everybody right now, honestly. If they're not looking for better players right now, you got an offensive line that's hurt. You got a secondary that's kind of patched. You know, so there are some holes to fill. So you got to always be looking for talent and people that fit your scheme. And that kind of brings us to our next topic. You, you, big fragrance guy you are, Jerry. I know you're going to be doing some fragrance reviews over on Real Talk with Jerry Ball, that YouTube launching later yep. this month. And so I got to know, are there any lions that stunk it up and need a fragrance recommendation from Jerry Ball? Yes, there, there is. And, and it actually goes and segues into this play, right? Um. I have different levels of fragrance. You know, we got a more affordable fragrance, and then we got the designer fragrances, and then we got the niche fragrance. When you're in the niche category, that means you're a playoff team and you're a world beater. The designer level, you know, you're actually, you know, a good football team, but you're trying to define yourself, right? So I'm going to show you something that would be at the designer level. Right, like you look at this platinum ego Chanel. Can you see that? I can, and that looks beautiful. Let me line it up. Yeah. Oh, there All right, is. so that's designer. So I need the lines to get that good. Uh, I need them to get alluring with this Chanel Alluring Sport Extreme or some of this John Paul. But none of them can earn the right to wear that. This is for winners, you know, Dior. Mm -hmm. Home, <laughs> winners like Hello, Terry Hall, right? Abadijo, Profundo. But today, we're going to go with an entry level because the Lions re really need to try to enter the winning category. So what we have is a, one of my old favorites. It's called Burberry Touch. Now, the reason why I chose this one is because the Lions need to be touched by an angel and get a win. <laughs> now, this is a very nice fragrance, you know, and I think it, it'll help the offensive line and the rest of them. Mm, that's nice. Might even get a compliment or two, you know, those that know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it, Jerry. <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. So uh, the offensive line, they're getting the fragrance or just the whole team? Well, actually, the offensive line is getting it, but it's one play, the reason why. And it's really the whole offense. That was a play where it was motion. If you're looking at our offensive line, it would have been they went to their to our left, their right. But they ran – you know, Hawkinson back across and had him blocking the defensive end. And the rookie didn't know to check back to help him. And if the coaches did not give him that responsibility to help the tight end block that defensive end, then they stunk it up. And that's why they need to be touched. <laughs> Well, hopefully the offensive line will be touched by Burberry and touched by an angel this coming up weekend. Yeah. It, moving on from that, does anyone deserve to be Jerry's baller of the weekend when you have a performance like that? Well, I, I, I'm regretfully going to have to tell you that the player of the game probably would have been number 28 if I had to choose it for the Bengals. I feel that he actually kept the pace different that allowed Burrow to actually succeed because you had to stop that guy. And Evans wasn't no slouch, but 28, he's special. So I would have I would have said he's the baller of the game, but he's with the other team, so I'm not going to do that. I'm going to – abstain from choosing someone this week you know and I, we'll go 
We'll go to this week and see if we can't find somebody. I I, th- I think that's the wisest decision here. I think after a perform, you don't burn the tape because you got to learn from it. But you you were not celebrating after something like that, and e- even still, we we have the play of the day. Do we got to punt on that as well? Is there any any highlight performance that we saw highlight play? Because it's a lot of negative memories in my mind. It, it, you know, it's. It, I would just say again, the the only thing positive was that the Lions team made it to the stadium for the kickoff. <laughs> oh, it's sad, but it is true, and that's why you, you know, know that's regretfully I'm saying that you know, but they showed up, but they didn't get it done, yeah. and they were at home too. So, yeah, it's just embarrassing in front of the home fans. And usually, you know, I go into this whole J and J, Jack and Jerry, PB and J can't even do it because that it's just it's frustrating. And it's not all bad on offense. Like TJ Hawkinson, he has eight grabs, he has 74 yards. DeAndre yeah. Swift, he's 18 touches, 67 yards, and a touchdown. Like, it's fine. Amadara St. Brown, we were talking about getting him more involved in the deep game. He has five receptions, only 26 yards, and that's just kind of a symptom of everything going on in Detroit right now is it's all dink and dunk from Jared Goff. Well, you know, I I think, you know, in in some of those passes to St. Brown, I could see why he went to him as that second and third option. But honestly – it's going to take them to really put in some different type work. You know, they can't actually go through the routine of practice. They're going to have to take meaningful steps in practice, you know, even to the point that you run your plays full speed. In practice, you know, you know, we go normally about 75%. But when you're trying to get your offense and the tempo time right, That means that you need to try to execute it as fast as you can in practice so you see what it looked like. And you do it, but you also setting a standard. All right? And when we run this play, this is the standard. That means the timing change. That means, like, in some of those balls that might have came out a second late has to come out quicker because he's going to be quick in his break. And they didn't really get the timing down at that speed because now you at game speed and you just been practicing. You hadn't been doing things meaningfully and and, and getting better and understanding how fast it's going to come, you know, and it's some extra work that they need receivers and that quarterback. They have to stay after practice. They got to be look at film together when they're actually looking at the defenses of the other team. They need to have, like the quarterbacks and the coordinators and the coaches have that little closed capsule of a meeting. The quarterback and the receivers need to have a capsule meeting without the coaches so that they can say, hey, if I see him do this, hey, I might give you this read. And then the quarterback say, no, don't do that. This is what I, give me this because I'm going to be, I'm going to have to, you know, in progression, look to my right. And you'll be my third read, so I need you to, you know, run it at 17 instead of 13. So if you're going to run a 13 out, where you go 13 and come back three, that means I'm getting it to you at a 10-yard route. But if it takes 17 and you come back 14, that gives me a little bit more time to go through my progressions. And those are the things that they have to work on without a coach. Because that's what they're going to do on in the game. That's the site adjustments that they have to make. And one of the things Dan Campbell mentioned in his post-game press conference is Wednesday's practice, they didn't go with pads. They, the thinking was, you know, we're kind of banged up right now. We need to get healthy. We're the, the second most injured team in the NFL right now. And he, he, it seems like he regrets it. And I, I can imagine there's going to be a lot of contact on Wednesday. You know, here, here look. This is the truth about pads. Pads can help definitely get you to a point where you work on the technique and some of the grinding things, right? But some of these efficiencies that I'm talking about 
can be done in what we call in shells. That's mm -hmm. where you might wear the helmet and just the shoulder pads. And you ain't trying to really get on the ground. You just wearing the shoulder pads for protection so that you can run your, your plays and you can go through the hole and the hole might close because you're practicing. So if you take a bang, you got your pads on. So you're not really banging, okay? Now, if his team is soft and he feels that they need to get tougher, then offensive line and defensive line are the ones that need the pads on. Mm. You really don't need the running backs unless he's given a look in, a, in some type of nine on seven look. Uh, wide receivers, DBs, really, the pads are for the defensive linemen, linebackers, you know, offensive line, tight ends. They're the ones that's actually got to really perfect the hitting art, you know? So it's good in some instances if you need it. And in some instances, like he said, their team is banged up. Then you have to be smart. You have to be as a coach. You got to get your players there to on Sunday. Don't matter how, how tough he is on Wednesday and Thursday. If you count on him to be your marquee player on Sunday, you can't beat him up and take his game out of his legs on Wednesdays and Thursdays. And I think that makes a lot of sense. It feels it, like we've seen them battling. We've seen them compete. I don't think this is a soft football team. I think it's a football team that just, I don't know what, it just didn't look like they belonged on Sunday. And I, maybe that could be a toughness, but it just feels like something was off. You know what? They look like a team that actually had been on a bye and they mm -hmm. came back and just started playing, but all the timing was off. It was miss, you know, it just it was just off. That's what it looked like. It was like off the timing. You know, it's like, you know, but again, I'm a little bit more critical because I got a different knowledge base than most. Of course. Okay. But I'm looking at that quarterback. And how he's managing the team. You're going to always hear me talk about how the quarterback is managing the team, whether or not he's down or he's up. He has to maintain a level of pause and directive to tell them this is what we're going to do. And I don't see him being that guy. I, well, let, let me say this. That was a judgment state. I hadn't seen him display that as the guy that's the quarterback for the Detroit Lions. I hadn't seen that. I don't. I don't we really he's got to find that. You know, he got to find that. And that's they're going to contend he has to find that. And, that. and that's one of the things Dan Campbell was saying after the game. He like he was getting questions about Jared Goff, and he starts it off. He doesn't put it all on Jared Goff, which is fair. It, it's a collective, as Dan Campbell said. Yep. And you, what you've been talking about, it's it has to be everyone. But then he's asked if they thought about sitting Jared. Dan Campbell says, no, I didn't. Asked about making a change at quarterback. He denies it. Says, not that that won't ever come up, but this is collective. You, you can't blame one person. And then they push just a little bit farther. And they ask, can you judge your quarterback without two starters on the offensive line? And then Dan Campbell kind of went off a little bit and I made some comments I didn't expect. Not that I disagree, but he doesn't feel like they can accurately judge them. And then a long pause. And then he admits, I feel like he needs to step up more than he has. I think he needs to help us just like everyone else. I think we he needs to put a little weight on his shoulders, make some throws and do some things, but he needs help. And, some of the holding calls he attributes to Jared Goff drifting too far back in the pocket. And so with those comments, it's got me wondering, was Pac-Man right when we were talking to the Believe in Bengals guys? Adam Pac-Man Jones calls Jared Goff Andy Dalton 2.0. After that game and after Dan Campbell's comments, I kind of get it. What do you think? Well, he definitely pointed to a perspective that when we seen the way he played on Sunday, we could identify those traits he described. Now, whether or not he's going to live his way out of 
that particular assessment is going to be on how well he can respond today, tomorrow, the next day. He's going to have to step up, you know, and I'm going to tell you in Detroit, that's that that town itself wants a winner. Right. And it's only been dealt with, you know, a couple of times where they really had competitive teams like late 80s, the 90s and things like that in the modern time. Right. So these people are really wanting a winning team. So Jared can find himself in tough company because of the simple fact, you know, you following Matt Stafford, that even though he left was a success, they didn't actually have the success as a team. But if you looked at his stats and what he was able to do with what he was given to work with under the circumstances of being with the Lions, and really not ever having a top flight free agent sign, you know, he, he did all right. And now he's, you know, you know, I, I anyway, I, I have some friends that's close to him, and they say that he's as happy as he's been in years, you know. Now, is Jared facing any of that? Is he feeling the weight of whatever it was Matthew was feeling that, you know, not just comes from the coach, but comes from meeting the expectation of the fan? Is he going to react to it or is he going to respond? You know, those are the things that separate the guys that become top tier from being just a quarterback. You know, that's, that's those extraordinary things that separate good from great. You know, you're in the locker room with the best in the world that has ever done it. All right. But what separates and make that guy in that locker room a man's man? It's going to be what he does. He's going to prove that to the other men that he is a man's man. And to the point that it, it won't be challenged. And when it's challenged, you better answer the bell. You know? And this is really the perfect opportunity for him to prove it. Jared Goff gets to return home to L.A., face his former team. The Lions get to face their former quarterback back in Matthew Stafford. That This is the perfect time for him to step up and prove that he is the guy for the Detroit Lions. Do you think he can do it? And what is the conversation heading into a date with the X? Well, I'm trying to trying to see the <laughs> trying to see the light at the end of this tunnel. You know, can Jared keep pace with Matthew Stafford, who's gonna be going against a defense that has a secondary that's equivocating in a lot of ways, waffling around, okay? Now, can Jared keep pace with that? What, you know, that's, is, so it's not, you know, Matthew and, and that offense can run up the board on you so quick. Will he be able to respond? You know, and that's, and then, here comes Aaron Donald. Terrifying. Absolutely terrifying. Hey, let me tell you. And, and I watched the game. You know, he's the closest thing to Reggie White I've seen in a long time. Yeah. And long time. You know, he got a great work ethic, but you know, I just, you know, now that he's, you know, moving all over the line from the defensive end to the three technique to the two technique, you know, man, shit, that's a problem. That's a problem. Yeah, well, especially we, we, we don't know if Taylor Decker will be back. We It could be him against a rookie at the left tackle, could be him against a basically a rookie at the right, basically a rookie at center it. Yeah. He, 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 here's how that go. Because they are moving him around, 
they're going to find the mix match. It don't matter who comes back. Wherever that mix match is, that's where he's going to line up the most. And that's what I would do. I'll play bully ball, whereas I'm going to let Aaron go bully him. Now, what that's going to have is now you got to either have a back stay and help him or you got to get a lineman to help him. So that means that's two men on one. So that means that we got one guy free that should be getting to the ball. Uh, and that's what we have to look forward to on Sunday, isn't it? We got problems. <laughs> we do. So, and, and things on, on a lighter note, I suppose some of the, the fans in the, the drafting community, the, the people that are already deep in the college football Lions already. zero and six people are talking. You got to take the edge rusher out of Oregon cave on Thibodeau. When you have the first overall pick, if you do, it's, it's way too early to be talking about that, but that's what the fans way are. Too early. So, so, so we, we don't know who, who would be the option there. You don't have, you don't have to lock yourself into a quarterback. If, if you do get that pick. Man, listen, it, it's too early to even have that discussion, you know, see now, but, but again, that goes with the lines in the history of not producing a consistent winner that the the fans look to settle on a high draft pick. But a high draft pick don't bring you success. It just gives you an opportunity to get you a good player. What 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 you going to do when you get Barry? What are you going to do when you get a Lomas Brown? What are you going to do when you get a Calvin Johnson? What are you going to do? How are you going to deal with that? That's that's the real issue. So it's not always about the draft pick at all. And if you know for real that there are more number one busts than they are number ones that were prominent players, and I'm not even talking about Hall of Famers or Pro Bowlers or All Pros. I'm talking about number one draft picks that were on a team, never made it, never cracked the starting line, never really was a consistent player, and played two, three, four, five years. That's not what you expect by any number one. You want your number ones, they expect them to play 10. Now, that's, kind of, that that's, that's kind of where I'm at, too. It, it's way too early. You talk about the season all the time in quarters. We're only halfway through the second quarter. Lots yeah. of football left to be played. Lots. Yeah. And, and, but it's a lot of interconference games, too. So the Lions can't afford to lose anything, you know, going forward. They definitely have to win this next game. You know, other than that, you know, the best they would be able to do was nine and seven. Last year was kind of funny because you had teams with some. Real funny records that got in the playoffs and stuff. Then I was like, they're in the playoffs? You know, so I'm not going to say nine and seven won't get them in, but it gets challenging. Mm -hmm. So we just and you start I'm sorry. And oh. you start relying on other teams to be the team for you to get in. And that's even crazier because now you're sitting and waiting and somebody else is deciding your faith. That's the thing. You never want someone else to decide your fate. You want to take control, grab life yeah. by the horns, be that alpha lion. And so we have to hope that they can do that later this weekend. But we'll preview that with the Rams matchup later this week on Thursday. Until then, Jerry, any pluggables you want to plug before we break it down? Hey, listen, I just want to, you know, tell all the Lion fans, listen, you guys keep the faith. You know, give them a chance. You know, this is the first year for the teams, new coaches and stuff. They got a new system. But also, I want to say something to the Lions organization. Hey, it's football. It's just football. Don't make it more complicated than it is. It's football. All right. On that note, you ready to break it down, Jerry? Yes, sir. Take it away. All right. One, two, three. We believe, believe. in the lines. <laughs>